Section 29 of Narrative of My Captivity Among the Sioux Indians by Fanny Kelly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dedicated to Mrs. Fanny Kelly by a Soldier. In early youth, far in the distant west, with gentle steps the fragrant fields you pressed. Then joy rebounded in thy youthful heart, nor thought of care or trouble bore no part. The morn of life, whose sky seems ever bright, and distant hills are tinged with crimson light, when hope, bright hope, by flowing fancies driven, filled thy young heart with raptured thoughts of heaven. T'was there, neath yonder glorious western sky, where noble forests wave their heads on high, and gentle zephyrs filled with rich perfume, swept o'er vast prairies in undying bloom, and there where silvery lakes and rippling streams go murmuring through the hills and valleys green, and birds sing gaily as they soar along, in gentle notes their ever-welcome song. T'was there was passed thy youthful life away, and all became a dread reality. Then wooed and wedded to the one you loved, as partner of thy life all else above, to share thy brightest hopes or gloomy fears, or mingle in thy smiles or gushing tears, to be to thee a constant bosom friend, faithful and true till life's last hours should end. Those days and years so pleasantly passed by, no tears of grief, thy bosom knew no sigh. But ah, those days, those halcyon days are past, those sunny hours they were too sweet to last. For far out o'er the broadest prairie plain, onward you pressed a distant home to gain. Days, even weeks, so pleasantly passed o'er, that memory brought back those sweet days of yore, those days of thy youth, for which you did sigh, but ne'er did ye think that some soon should die. For days of sadness, those days that come to all, from the humblest cot to the palace hall, when gathering darkness cloud the clear blue sky, our brightest prospects all in ruin lie. While gathering round the camp at close of day, as the sun shed forth her last but lingering ray, the war-whoop of the Sioux Indian band was heard, they come, and all surrounded stand. A moment more, and then around thee lay, as the dark smoke had cleared itself away, the lifeless forms of those in horror slain, and thou, alas, the only one remain. No bosom friend, no counsellor is near, to soothe thy troubled breast or quell thy fear. Those dearest by all earthly ties are fled, and you, a captive, stood among the dead. For months in bondage to this savage band, with none to rescue from his cruel hand, to rove with them o'er prairies far and wild, far from thy husband and thy murdered child. No star of hope, nor sun's resplendent light, sends down one gleam upon this fearful night. No power to pierce the dark and hidden gloom that veils the heart while in this earthly tomb. But lo, a change, a wondrous change to thee, once held a captive, but now from bondage free. The great Jehovah reigns, his arm is strong, he sets the captive free, though waiteth long, and turns the darkest hours of midnight gloom into the effulgent brightness of noon. W. S. V. H. Certificate of Indian Chiefs Personally appeared before me a notary public for the District of Columbia, Mrs. Fanny Kelly, who is at this time a citizen of the state of Kansas, and being duly sworn, deposes and says, that in the year 1864 she started from Geneva, Allen County, Kansas, for the purpose of settling with her husband and family in Montana, and for this purpose she with her husband took all the goods and chattels they had, which are enumerated below, with a mountain value. She further says she is now a widow and has a family to support. But she was for many months a prisoner, and taken captive by a band of the Sioux Indians, at the time at war with the white people and with the united states as follows on the twelfth day of july eighteen sixty four while on the usually travelled road across the plains and west of fort laramie she with her husband and family with several other persons were attacked by these indians 
and five of the party were killed, while she was taken captive. That the Indians took or destroyed all they had. She was a captive for five months, suffered hardships and taunts, and was finally delivered to the military authorities of the United States in Dakota at Fort Sully. That the following is a statement of their goods and effects, including stock, as near as she can remember. The whole account was made out and placed, as she is informed, in the hands of Dr. Burley, late delegate from Dakota, but which she cannot find at this time. The amount and the leading items she knows to be as follows. Omission. Fanny Kelly, subscribed and sworn to before me this 24th day of February, A.D. 1870. James H. McKenney, Notary Public, Washington County, D.C. City of Washington, District of Columbia, June 8, 1870. We the undersigned, chiefs and head men of the Dakota or Sioux Indians, do hereby acknowledge and certify to the facts set forth in the foregoing affidavit of Mrs. Fanny Kelly, as to her captivity and to the destruction of her property by members of our nation. We acknowledge the justness of her claim against us for the loss of her goods, and desire that the same may be paid her out of any monies now due our nation, or that may become due us by annuity or by any appropriation made by Congress and we would respectfully request that the amount as set forth in the foregoing bill be paid to Mrs. Fanny Kelly by the department, out of any funds that may now or hereafter belong to us. Spotted Tail, Chief of the Brule Sioux. Swift Bear, Chief of the Brule Sioux. Fast Bear, Warrior, Brule Sioux. Yellow Hair, Warrior, Brule Sioux. I certify that I was present when the above statement was signed by said Brule Sioux chiefs and warriors, and that the same was fully explained to them before they subscribed to same by the interpreter. Charles E. Gueru, Sioux Interpreter. Washington, D.C., June 9, 1870. Witnessed by DeWitt C. Poole, Captain U.S. Army, and Agent for Sioux Indians. Red Cloud, Red Dog, Rocky Bear, Long Wolf, sword, setting bear, little bear, yellow. I certify that I was present when the above statement was signed by the Ogallala chiefs and warriors, and that the same was fully explained to them before they subscribed to the same by the interpreter. John Richard. Witness, Jules Coffey. Washington, D.C., June 11, 1870. Little Swan, Pretty Bear, Black Tomahawk, Red Feather. I certify on honor that I was present when the above statement was signed by the said chiefs and warriors of the Minicanyan and Souse Arks bands of Sioux Indians, and that the same was fully explained to them by Basil Clemens, interpreter, witness F. D. Curtis, George M. Randall, Captain and Brevet Major, U.S.A., Indian Agent, New York, July 14, 1870. Certified Copies of My Correspondence with Captain Fisk Washington, D.C., January 13, 1865 L. Thomas, Adjutant General, U.S.A., Washington, D.C. General, we made our start from Fort Ridgely, where I had received the kindest attentions and important favors from the officers in charge, on the afternoon of the 15th of July. The Truce, a Captive White Woman Soon there was a gathering of what appeared to be all the Indians about, on an eminence of prairie one mile away, and in full sight of the camp. There came from the crowd three unarmed warriors toward the train, holding up a white flag which they planted in the ground about seven hundred yards off, and then retired. This was an unexpected phase to the affair. While we were making extra preparations for war, there came a truce. I sent Mitchell, my brave and efficient officer of the guard, with two Sioux half-bred interpreters, to ascertain the meaning of this overture. They found, on reaching the ground, a letter stuck in a stick, and directed to me. Without pausing to converse with the Indians, who were a few rods distant, my assistant returned to camp with the letter. That letter appeared to have been written by a white woman, a captive in the hands of the Indians, and read as follows. Makatunke says he will not fight wagons, for they have been fighting two days. They had many killed by the goods they brought into camp. 
They tell me what to write. I do not understand them. I was taken by them July 12. They say for the soldiers to give forty head of cattle. Hehuta Lunka says he fights not, but they have been fighting. Be kind to them and try to free me for mercy's sake. I was taken by them July 12. Signed, Mrs. Kelly. Buy me if you can, and you will be satisfied. They have killed many whites. Help me if you can. Unka Papas, they put words in and I have to obey. They say for the wagons they are fighting for them to go on. But I fear the result of this battle. The Lord have mercy on you. Do not move. I replied to this letter as follows. Mrs. Kelly, if you are really a white woman captive in the hands of these Indians, I shall be glad to buy you and restore you to your friends, and if a few unarmed Indians will deliver you at the place where your letter was received, I will send there for them three good American horses, and take you to our camp. I cannot allow any party of Indians, few or many, to come to my train or camp while in this country. Tell them I shall move when I get ready, and halt as long as I think proper. I want no advice or favor from the Indians who attacked, but am prepared to fight them as long as they choose to make war. I do not in the least fear the result of this battle. Hoping that you may be handed to us at once for the offer I have made, I am truly, signed, James L. Fisk, Captain Commanding. The above letter was sent back by the Indian messenger, and we awaited the result. In the afternoon we received the following reply. I am truly a white woman, and now in sight of your camp, but they will not let me go. They say they will not fight, but don't trust them. They say, how do ye do? They say they want you to give them sugar, coffee, flour, gunpowder, but give them nothing till you can see me for yourself, but induce them taking me first. They want four wagons, and they will stop fighting. They want forty cattle to eat. I have to write what they tell me. They want you to come here, you know better than that. His name Chotvanko, and the other's name Porcupine. Read to yourself, some of them speak English. They say this is their ground. They say, go home and come back no more. The Fort Laramie soldiers have been after me, but they, the Indians, run so. And they say they want knives and axes and arrow iron to shoot buffalo. Tell them to wait and go to town, and they can get them. I would give them anything for liberty. Induce them to show me before you give anything. They are very anxious for you to move now. Do not, I implore you, for your life's sake. Fanny Kelly. My residence, formerly Geneva, Allen County, Kansas. I returned by the Indian the following reply. Dear Madam, your second communication convinces me that you are what you profess to be, a captive white woman, and you may be assured that myself and my party are eager for release, but for the present I cannot accede to the demands or gratify the wants of your captors. We are sent on an important trust and mission by order of the great war chief at Washington, westward to the mountain region, with a small party of well-armed and determined men, feeling entirely capable of defending ourselves. But we are not a war party, and our train is not intended for war purposes. Powder and shot we have, but no presents for the hostile Indians. I am an officer of the government, but am not authorized, by my instructions, to give anything but destruction to Indians who try to stop me on my march. However, I will, for your release, give three of my own horses, some flour, sugar, and coffee, or a load of supplies. Tell the Indians to go back for the night, and tomorrow at noon, if they will send you with five men to deliver you to my soldiers on the mound we occupied today, their main body not to advance beyond their present position, I will hand over to them the horses and provisions, which they will be permitted to take away to their headquarters. Should there be occasion, the same opportunity for communicating will be granted tomorrow. The Great Spirit tells me that you will yet be safely returned to your friends, and that all wrongs that have been committed on the defenseless and innocent shall be avenged. In warmest sympathy, I am, Madame, James L. Fisk, 
Captain and AQM USA. With high regard, I have the honor to be, yours very truly, James L. Fisk, Captain and AQM, Commanding Expedition. Adjutant General's Office, Washington, March 17, 1870, Official Extract. William Beach, Assistant Adjutant General. Statement of Lieutenant G. A. Hesselberger. Washington, D.C., February 16, 1870. To the Honorable James Harlan, Chairman, Committee of Indian Affairs, U.S. Senate. Sir, I have the honor to make the following statement in relation to the captivity and release of Mrs. Fanny Kelly. In the summer of 1864, an expedition under the command of General Alfred Sully, U.S.A., started against the hostile Sioux in Dakota Territory, of which expedition I was a member, being then an officer, first lieutenant, in the 6th Iowa Volunteer Cavalry. Whilst on the expedition, we ascertained that Mrs. Fanny Kelly was a prisoner of the Indians that we were then engaged against. After the command returned to Fort Rice, in Dakota Territory, news was received from Captain Fisk, an officer of the Engineer Department, USA, that he was surrounded, and his train corralled by the same Indians that we had been fighting. I, with others, saw Fisk, and was personally told by him that he had received notes and letters of warning from Mrs. Kelly, telling him that he must not break his train, and that the Indians intended to fall upon the two portions, if he did, and to massacre his guard and the emigrants and children with him. In the fall, after the expedition had been abandoned, the troops were scattered at different posts along the Missouri River, I with my company being left at Fort Sully, Dakota Territory. About the latter part of November, an Indian came inside the post. I, being officer of the day, asked him what he wanted. He said he came a long way and wanted to know if I was the big chief. If so, he had a paper for me to see. He gave it to me. It was a sheet torn out of a business book and numbered seventy-six in the corner. The substance of the letter was as follows. I write this letter and send it by this Indian, but don't know whether you will get it, as they are very treacherous. They have lied to me so often. They have promised to bring me to town nearly every day. I wish you could do something to get me away from them. If they do bring me to town, be guarded, as they are making all kinds of threats and preparations for an attack. I have made a pencil of a bullet, so it might be hard to read. Please treat this Indian well. If you don't, they might kill me. After having the Indian remain for a few days, and giving him plenty to eat, he was sent on his return with a letter to Mrs. Kelly. A short time after this, one morning, we discovered, back of the fort on the hill, a large body of Indians. The commanding officer was notified of the fact. He immediately gave orders to prepare the fort for defense. Since the warning received from Mrs. Kelly, we had been unusually watchful of the Indians. The fort was poorly constructed, having been built by soldiers for winter quarters. The Indians were notified not to approach the fort, and only the chiefs, who numbered ten or twelve, were allowed to come inside the gates, bringing with them Mrs. Kelly, and when inside the fort the gates were immediately closed, shutting out the body of Indians, who numbered about one thousand to twelve hundred. A bargain was made for her, and the articles agreed upon were delivered for her in exchange. I believe, and it was the opinion of others, that the advice and warning of Mrs. Kelly was very valuable to us, and was instrumental in putting us on our guard, and enabled us to ward off the threatened attack of the Indians. In my opinion, had the Indians attacked the fort, they could have captured it. The day that Mrs. Kelly was brought into the fort was one of the coldest I ever experienced, and she was very poorly clad, having scarcely anything to protect her person. Her limbs, hands, and face were terribly frozen, and she was put in the hospital at Fort Sully, where she remained for a long time, nearly two months, for treatment. Signed, G. A. Hesselberger, First Lieutenant, U.S. Army, Residence, Leavenworth City. Treasury Department, 2nd Auditor's Office, June 3, 1870. The foregoing is a correct copy of the statement of Lieutenant Hesselberger on file in this office.
E. B. French. Statement of Officers and Members of the 6th Iowa Cavalry We the undersigned, late officers and members of the 6th Iowa Cavalry, being duly sworn, do hereby depose and say that, during the winter of the years 1864 and 1865, the said 6th Iowa Cavalry was stationed, and doing military duty, at Fort Sully, in the territory of Dakota, that we, in our respective military capacities, were present during the winter stated, at the aforesaid post of Fort Sully. Deponents further say that, on or about the 6th day of December, in the year 1864, an Indian appeared before the fort, and signified to the officer of the day, Lieutenant G. A. Hesselberger, that he had something to communicate to those within the fort, and the said Indian was allowed to enter, and he presented to the commanding officer, Major A. E. House, of the regiment before stated, a note or letter, which letter we all thoroughly knew the purport of, and it was seen and read by blank. It was written, or purported to be, by one Mrs. Fanny Kelly, who represented herself as a captive in the hands of certain Blackfeet Sioux Indians, and that, under a pretext of delivering her up to her people, they intended attacking the town or village to which they purposed going. Deponents further say that, at the time of the receipt of this letter, the said Fort Sully was not in such a state of defense as would have enabled the garrison to hold it against the attack of any considerable body of men, that, in consequence of the receipt of said letter, Major House brought the cannon in position to bear on all sides of the fort, and otherwise ordered and disposed of the garrison to withstand any attempt to capture or destroy the fort. Deponents further say that, on or about the ninth day of December, the said Mrs. Fanny Kelly was brought in as a captive, and delivered by the Indians to the commanding officer at Fort Sully, that the Indians came up to the fort painted in war paint, and singing their war songs, that as soon as Mrs. Kelly was within the gates of the fort, they were closed, and all the Indians, save those who had her directly in charge, were shut out from entrance into said fort. Deponents further say that they verily believe, from information then gained, and from that which they afterward learned, it was the intention of the Indians to attack the fort, and they were only prevented from doing so by the preparations which the letter of warning from the said Mrs. Fanny Kelly had induced the commanding officer to make, and they verily believe that, had the attack been made without such preparations, it would have resulted in the capture of the fort and the massacre of its inmates, and such was the expressed opinion of nearly all the members of the said 6th Iowa Cavalry then stationed therein, and further deponents say not. Signed, John Logan, Captain Company K, 6th Regiment, Iowa Cavalry. Dean Cheadle, O.S., 6th Regiment, Iowa Cavalry. John M. Williams, Q.M.S., 6th Regiment, Iowa Cavalry. John McGee, Sergeant Company H, 6th Regiment, Iowa Cavalry. John Cooper, Corporal, Company K, 6th Regiment, Iowa Cavalry. Merritt M. Oakley, Corporal, Company H, 6th Regiment, Iowa Cavalry. Personally appeared before me, A. J. McKean, Clerk of the District Court, Lynn County, State of Iowa, and made solemn oath that the foregoing is true and correct in all particulars, and that neither of the parties hereto subscribing is interested in any way in any effort which the said Mrs. Kelly may make, or has made, for indemnity on this twenty-second day of January, A.D. 1870. A.J. McKean, Clerk District Court, Lynn County, Iowa. Treasury Department, Second Auditor's Office, December 2, 1870. I certify the foregoing to be a true copy of the original held in this office. E. B. French, Second Auditor. The memoranda below are written with pencil. Captain Logan was the officer of the day when Mrs. Kelly was brought into the fort, Sully. John McGee, Sergeant Company H, 6th Iowa Cavalry, was Sergeant of the Guard at the same time. To Honorable James Harlan, U.S.S., and Honorable William Smith, M.C., 2nd Congressional District, Iowa. Gentlemen, I was at Fort Sully when the arrangement was made for the capture of this woman, was not there when the Indians brought her into the fort, 
but am satisfied that the above affidavit in the main is correct. Signed, T.S. Bardwell, Late Assistant Surgeon, 6th Iowa Cavalry. Treasury Department, 2nd Auditor's Office, December 24, 1870. I certify the foregoing to be a true copy of the original filed in this office. E.B. French, 2nd Auditor. End of section 29. End of Narrative of My Captivity Among the Sioux Indians by Fanny Kelly.